Hola, buenos días a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Stephanie Delgado y soy directora de gestión de portafolio de inversión en Profonampe, el Fondo Ambiental del Perú. Les quiero dar la bienvenida a la tercera sesión de nuestro ciclo de conferencias virtuales La Ruta de Carbón. Como les he comentado anteriormente, este ciclo cuenta con cinco sesiones, siempre los jueves a esta misma hora, en los que tenemos la oportunidad de conversar con especialistas sobre diversos temas relacionados a proyectos de carbono. La Ruta de Carbono nos prepara para nuestro encuentro presencial que será del 23 al 26 de octubre en Cusco, Perú, en el Congreso Red Lab 2023. Red Lab es la red de fondos ambientales de Latinoamérica y el Caribe, que cuenta con 27 fondos que son de 19 países. Red Lab celebra un congreso anual para intercambiar experiencias y lecciones aprendidas, siempre junto con aliados estratégicos que pueden ser representantes gubernamentales, eh, empresas del sector privado y otros actores de la comunidad ambiental. Pueden visitar el enlace web que está abajo a la izquierda en la pantalla, congreso.redlab.org, para aprender más sobre los temas que se estarán tratando en este congreso. Lamentablemente, las inscripciones se han cerrado porque ya hemos llenado el aforo, ya no entran más personas, lo cual obviamente nos hace súper este, felices. Para las personas que ya se han inscrito al congreso, eh, dentro del Congreso eh, habrán dinámicas de salas temáticas donde se trabajarán diversos temas y junto el Fondo Ambiental de Colombia, Fondo Acción y Profonampe estaremos liderando la sala temática Mercados de Carbono. Así que si van a ir a Cusco, no olviden inscribirse para participar en la, san, en la sala de Mercado de Carbono para seguir aprendiendo juntos sobre estos temas. Y bueno, para los que no, se unen por primera vez a, esta, a la ruta de carbono, eh, las, las semanas pasadas hemos visto eh, diversos tipos de proyectos de carbono relacionados a soluciones basadas en naturaleza. Hemos estado con, con María Claudia Díaz Granados, de Conservación Internacional, hablando sobre carbono azul. Luego hemos estado con Jaime Nalbarte de Aider, hablando sobre el rol de proyectos RED como un mecanismo de financiamiento para áreas naturales protegidas. Y hoy este, vamos a hablar sobre un tipo de proyectos nuevos, que son los créditos de biodiversidad. En, la, en general, la conversación eh, relacionada al mercado de carbono o al, al calentamiento global está migrando a darle un doble clic a este tema, o sea, no solo hablar de cómo podemos hacer para reducir el calentamiento global, sino también qué es exactamente lo que estamos tratando de proteger. Y en ese sentido hoy tenemos el agrado de eh, contar con una invitada súper especial que es Sinclair Vincent de Berra. Eh, Berra es uno de los estándares más utilizados en el Perú para proyectos RED. Sinclair se desempeña como directora de innovación del desarrollo sostenible, supervisando la estrategia, la estrategia, dirección y evolución de los programas enfocados en desarrollo sostenible de Berra, incluyendo el, esta, el estándar de impacto verificado de desarrollo sostenible, los estándares de clima, comunidad y biodiversidad, y el estándar de reducción de desechos plásticos. Sinclair también lidera los estándares y desarrollo de mercado del marco de naturaleza de Berra y la metodología de créditos de biodiversidad. Sinclair obtuvo una maestría en ciencias ambientales y gestión de la Brent School en la, en la Universidad de California en Santa Bárbara, donde se especializó en prevención y remediación de la contaminación y gestión ambiental corporativa. También tiene una licenciatura en ciencias ambientales de la Universidad de Florida. Antes de darle el paso a Sinclair, que nos va a estar contando sobre estos créditos en inglés, les recuerdo que abajo en el Zoom tienen la opción de incluir preguntas que nosotros iremos revisando y trataremos de compartir con Sinclair después de la presentación las preguntas más votadas. Entonces, cambiamos a inglés. Este, hi, Sinclair, how are you? Hello. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Great. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and, and jump in here. Um, uh, as, as Stephanie mentioned, I am leading development of our biodiversity crediting work. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of kind of where our thinking is for biodiversity credits and what we've uh, developed so far. So if you jump to the next slide, I'm going to start by just making sure that um, everyone knows who VERA is. Um, so VERA is a standard setting organization um, aiming to accelerate action on climate change and sustainable development through standards that help drive investment towards measurable high integrity outcomes across the world. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see all of the different programs that we currently operate. Um, VERA was established in 2007, starting with the Verified Carbon Standard, which is what we're most known for. Um, we are a nonprofit organization headquartered in Washington, DC, although at this point um, we're, we're really a, a remote uh, organization operating uh, with staff across the world. And it's through these different programs that you see on the screen that we help catalyze measurable outcomes by driving large scale investment in activities that reduce emissions, reduce plastic waste, improve livelihoods and protect nature. And so each of these standards are globally applicable and span a wide range of sectors and activities. Um, and so while we are most known for our voluntary greenhouse gas program, the, the VCS standard or program, um, I'm going to focus on our sustainable development uh, program today, which is uh, where we're developing our nature framework. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that we have the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard, or SD-VISTA for short, um, which is one of our newer standards. It was launched in 2019, um, but it's the premier standard for certifying real-world benefits of social and environmental projects. Um, we do this by helping, again, to bring finance to projects that can demonstrate some type of sustainable development benefit. Next slide. So there's a, a several reasons why we decided to develop the SD VISTA standard. Um, VERA also operates the Climate Community and Biodiversity Standards, which are often used alongside RED projects uh, in the VCS program. And the CCB standards are used to demonstrate broad social and environmental benefits, but only for the land use sector. Um, so projects in the land use space. Um, and only for those that can demonstrate impacts in all three categories, climate, community and biodiversity. Um, but what we were hearing was that there were a number of project developers who wanted to use the CCB standards to demonstrate their sort of beyond carbon benefits, but were excluded from doing so because they weren't strictly land use projects or they couldn't meet all three impact categories. So we took the core elements of the CCB standards, which were developed over many years of consultation with a wide range of stakeholders and expanded the scope to cover all sectors. Um, we're also, we also revised the sort of the framing so that the new standard SD VISTA would uh, directly address sustainable development uh, because the United Nations sustainable development goals were already then uh, when we developed the standard widely used for reporting sustainable development achievements, we decided to align SD VISTA with the SDGs. And our goal for SD VISTA is to help advance the achieve, achievement of the SDGs by supporting and bringing finance to those high impact sustainable development projects. Next slide. So SD VISTA allows for three different pathways for demonstrating the benefits that are coming from a project. So the first is just through uh, project claims. So these would be verified claims that highlight a unique contribution to the SDGs. Um, the next sort of category of uh, benefit demonstration is through labels. So these are uh, essentially a marker of SD VISTA certification that can be applied to units uh, generated under another program. So typically in this case, it's a verified carbon unit, which is the carbon credit that's generated under our VCS program. And then projects apply the SD VISTA label to show buyers that they have also certified to SD VISTA and have these additional um, sustainable development benefits. And then the last pathway that SD VISTA operate, uh, offers is assets. So you can actually generate standardized um, registered units um, representing a unique benefit or SDG contribution under SD VISTA. This is of course optional. Um, it just has to be done using an approved asset methodology. 
Um, and that is actually the pathway that we are um, using to develop what we call the nature framework, but is functionally um, the biodiversity crediting methodology under SD Vista. So jumping to the next slide, um, I'll kind of shift into talking a little bit more specifically about the SD Vista nature framework. And you can actually go ahead to the next one as well. Um, so our objective for the nature framework is to certify and incentivize widespread investment in measurable positive biodiversity outcomes benefiting nature and people. Um, and for us, it's important to clarify that what we mean when we say a positive biodiversity outcome is an increase in the amount or quality of biodiversity relative to a baseline resulting from effective management of conservation and restoration projects. So that sort of includes kind of both the scope of the nature framework as well as what do we mean when we say a positive biodiversity outcome. Next slide. So just to give a little bit more of a background on why we decided to, to develop this nature framework, um, <clears throat> nature-based climate solutions like a forest regrowth or restoring coastal wetlands are channeling funding to the conservation of priority ecosystems. Um, but many high quality conservation efforts remain inadequately funded and many of the services that they provide beyond carbon sequestration like a species like species um, conservation, water purification, soil health, or efforts to preserve marine biodiversity have no monetization pathway. And then at the same time, companies and other market participants lack a structured auditable channel to actually invest in nature. So in response to these challenges, Vera is developing the nature framework to really help drive finance to those critical nature conservation and restoration activities and help meet the global biodiversity framework goals and targets, which was just um, uh, agreed to in Montreal in December of last year. So the nature framework encompasses concepts and core principles for the generation of nature credits, along with generalized steps for measuring those positive biodiversity outcomes. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of what goes into the nature framework after um, covering the use case in the next slide. Um, and I'll even cover in a, in a few slides from now, uh, the quantification method. So just first coming to the use cases, you know, why would somebody buy a nature credit or what many other organizations refer to as a biodiversity credit? Um, nature credits can provide companies a verified way to support high quality projects, um, as well as indigenous peoples and local communities or the, the stewards of biodiversity while addressing their impacts and dependencies on nature by de-risking their value chains. And we see sort of two main use cases um, that companies would likely uh, pursue. The first is focused on the impacts on nature. So companies could invest beyond the mitigation hierarchy for accumulated existing impacts or industry-wide impacts that are not attributable to an individual entity. So it's not necessarily an impact that is directly attributable to that company, but it is attributable to their sector and, and would make sense for them to invest in addressing that impact. And the other use case that we see uh, being the most likely use case is, is about dependencies on nature. Um, so companies looking to secure their reliance on functional ecosystems and their services, like the ability to regulate water flow or water quality um, and managing hazards like fires and floods, um, and I think we'll start to see companies really dig into their impacts and dependencies on nature. Um, as we know, the Global Biodiversity Framework um, does talk in Target 15 about uh, large corporations and financial institutions disclosing their impacts and dependencies. We have the, the TNFD, which recently came out in its final version just last week, that will also provide a disclosure um, you know, framework for companies to disclose their dependencies on nature. And once companies start to understand that, they're most likely going to want to invest in securing those dependencies so that, so that they can operate um, well into the future. So those are the, the use cases that we see for nature credits, uh, which is important because it informs the design of the framework and how we write a methodology um, and generate uh, credits under this framework. So the next slide, um, talks about you know, what is a nature credit. Um, 
For us, a nature credit represents one unit of biodiversity benefit or improvement, and we use quality hectares as the metric. Um, it's a bit tricky in this space because uh, we don't have one metric that really works for all biodiversity and all across different standards or programs, um, as we do in carbon, where we use ton of CO2 equivalent um, as the main metric. Um, for us, we're using quality hectares. And most programs out there are talking about some sort of incremental improvement in biodiversity over a hectare. Um, and then the other important thing to highlight uh, around what is a nature credit is that it is not an offset. It is not meant to be used to offset um, or compensate for negative impacts um, in the way that carbon credits can be used to offset um, those emissions that a company cannot directly mitigate or, or reduce from their footprint. Um, and then moving kind of into the middle of the slide is we're talking about additional benefits to communities and to sustainable development. Um, of course, most projects, if not all, that are uh, focused on biodiversity improvements are also providing additional benefits um, to the communities in the area or other um, sustainable development aspects like um, you know, water, clean water, access to water. Um, so the way that SD Vista works, it easily allows these projects to not only demonstrate their biodiversity benefits, but also their benefits aligned with any other SDG. And then of course, with any SD Vista project, you can then add those benefits to your carbon project. And then lastly, um, any nature credits generated under our framework would be recorded and retired on our public registry as uh, with any uh, assets class generated under our programs. So my next slide um, and the one after that talk about the key design objectives that we used while developing the nature framework. Um, so I'll just walk through each one. Um, the first is that nature credits um, and the nature framework should be applicable across different types of biodiversity and for terrestrial, marine, and freshwater uh, realms. So it is meant to be a truly globally applicable framework. And the second one here is that we are really trying to establish a balance between standardization to allow for some level of comparability across projects, even though we know that biodiversity is not comparable. It's different in every um, ecosystem and, and land area or sea area, um, but we do wanna allow for some comparability um, while balancing with flexibility to uh, account for, like I just said, the project's local ecological and social context. We also want to establish a balance between rigor um, and accessibility. So rigor to ensure high integrity credits and outcomes, um, but accessibility to promote broad participation, including uh, by indigenous peoples and local communities, um, who we know are uh, the stewards of most of the biodiversity in the world. And then the last one on this slide is, is really just to, to promote confidence and integrity and not just nature credits generated under this framework, but the nature or biodiversity credit market more broadly. And then on the next slide, we have four more uh, key design objectives. So uh, number five is to support conservation of ecosystems at high risk of biodiversity loss. So wanting to, to allow finance to, to funnel into areas where there is high risk of, of loss of existing biodiversity, so areas under threat. Um, <clears throat> we also wanna build on the lessons of the voluntary carbon markets, which I'll also come back to in a few slides from now, but uh, making sure that we're learning from what's already been done in, in other markets, not just carbon, uh, but that is a big one. Um, number seven here is to also be thinking about rewarding long-term long -term stewardship of nature. So this is about areas that are not necessarily under imminent threat. And while as currently written, our nature credits wouldn't uh, cover this, this type of project, we have included uh, this concept in our consultation draft and would love to get input on it. Um, where we could create a, a different pathway. So perhaps a nature stewardship credit or certificate that would reward long-term stewardship uh, for areas that are not under threat. Um, and then lastly is uh, for projects to transparently report their contributions to global conservation priorities so that buyers can make informed investments in nature. So this comes through in what we call sort of a significance attribute layer for projects. Um, and there's four 
targets uh, aligned with the Global Biodiversity Framework Goal A um, that projects would have to report against um, in a very simple way, but it's really just to help buyers understand, you know, what are the priorities for this project? Are they more focused on conservation or restoration? Do they have a lot of um, endangered species in the area? That kind of thing, so that the buyers are, are really understanding what type of area they're investing in. So on the next slide is just a kind of uh, high level graphic that explains a little bit about how the nature framework and SD Vista work together. So as I said, the nature framework is designed as an SD Vista asset methodology. So that means that all projects seeking SD Vista certification have to follow the rules and requirements in the program documents, um, which include the SD Vista standard and the SD Vista program guide. Um, and then they also, if they're seeking to generate nature credits, have to follow the requirements that are in the nature framework um, and in the ecosystem or biome specific modules that we'll be developing over time. So they kind of have to follow all of those rules and requirements. That's what you see in the center of the circle diagram. And then um, on the, the left hand side where it says independent auditing, that represents the fact that all SD Vista projects must be assessed by qualified independent third parties to ensure that the SD Vista and Nature Framework rules and requirements are met. Um, and then on the right side, you have the registry system. Um, and that is just to say that the VERA registry tracks the generation, retirement, and cancellation of SD Vista assets, in this case, nature credits. So that's just kind of high level how the program works with this asset methodology. So coming to the next slide, I wanted to give a, a high level overview. I don't want to get too technical um, because, of course, you can read the uh, first draft that's out for consultation now um, and dig into some of the details if you are interested in the quantification. Um, but I did want to give a little bit of an idea of how the quantification of these biodiversity outcomes work works, at least as proposed now in the first draft. Um, so jumping to the next slide, we have like the, the first few steps of the quantification method. So we're really focused on extent and ecosystem condition um, at project start and then measuring that over time. So when we say extent, we essentially mean the area of the project where activities are being implemented. So as the first step, the project would need to measure its extent um, in hectares and then uh, select appropriate condition indicators. So this would be ecosystem condition indicators um, that are appropriate to the context, the ecosystem of that project. And then they'll be asked to define reference values for each of those condition indicators. So essentially, as you can kind of see on the far right side, you'd be um, establishing what the reference state is of sort of pristine state for each indicator and compare that to the sort of measured um, status of that indicator um, in the project area and standardize that between zero and one. So that's where you pick up in, in step four here where you're measuring those condition indicators and then standardizing them by the reference values and combining those into an overall estimate of the condition at project start. And then you just multiply that by the extent or area of the project to calculate what we call the condition ad adjusted area again, in quality hectares. So if you jump to the next slide, you can see kind of where we take the input from the previous slide of those condition adjusted uh, area at project start. And then you're trying to, in your next step, actually figure out what is your crediting baseline. So what would be the trend for ecosystem loss over time, starting from that original you know, project start condition. So project proponents would be asked to calculate the expected trend and project condition adjusted area in the absence of the project intervention. And this is actually going to be, as we've proposed, based on locally allocated eco-regional baseline trends that are set by third parties. So Vera is working with um, third parties to actually get the data that we need to establish eco-regional baselines for projects so that the burden is actually not on the project to, to figure out its project specific baseline. Um, and then in the next step, uh, the project would be asked to calculate its condition adjusted area at each monitoring date. So anytime that the project is monitoring and then looking to verify, they would assess the change in extent and condition during that implementation time and sum that across ecosystem types. 
And then on the next slide, we have the last few steps of how you kind of convert those impacts over time to biodiversity outcomes and credits. So you would first determine the biodiversity impacts, which are equal to the difference between project impacts and the crediting baseline, as you can kind of see in this graphic here, and summed across all of the ecosystem types, because there could be multiple ecosystem types in a given project. And then you would also subtract leakage. And there, there are details in the methodology um, about how you quantify leakage. Um, and then the next step would be calculating your shared buffer account contribution. So for those familiar with projects in the AFLU space and in our carbon program, you would understand that there um, you know, is a risk of permanence or, or loss of the benefits that are, have been achieved by the project. And so we do require projects to de essentially deposit a portion of the credits generated into a buffer account so that we can cancel credits if there, if there is any sort of reversal. And then in the final step here, uh, you calculate your nature credits by deducting the buffer contribution from your biodiversity impacts. And that is, is where you would get the number of nature credits. So again, a very sort of quick and high level overview of the quantification method, but I did just wanna give you a flavor for how that would work, um, particularly for those of you that might be familiar with project development or are interested in quantifying these benefits. So on the next slide, I just wanted to go over a couple of the sort of challenges and opportunities that we see in biodiversity credit markets. I think it's good to kind of go into such a nascent market with a, a clear understanding of, of the challenges and opportunities. Um, so just starting on the challenges side, um, the first is being able to prioritize outcomes and limited finance. So <clears throat> there is unfortunately limited finance, um, at least for now. And so we do need to kind of understand where should where should we prioritize our investments, um, and that requires you know a balance of transparency um, and and design for market behavior. So that's why we want to include things like this significance attribute so that buyers know where their money is going and they can you know understand if they're investing in something that's more along the lines of restoration or about a particular species um, that's of interest to them, making sure that at least the information is transparently provided to them so that we can kind of best prioritize limited finance. The next one is, is about this being a, a bit of a fractured market. As I mentioned earlier, um, we don't have one metric that's agreed on by all standards bodies or methodology developers in this space in the way that we do with carbon, right? With a, a ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, there are multiple methodologies and unit definitions being used right now in the biodiversity credit market, which is not necessarily bad. Um, we may over time kind of all coalesce around one unit definition. Um, my guess is that won't happen. And there might be a couple that sort of float to the top and have um, well justified approaches for different contexts. Um, and I think that would be a, a perfectly fine outcome, but we'll have to see. And I think the benefit of having um, multiple unit definitions and methodologies is at least at this stage is that we're able to really test and innovate on these approaches and see what works and what doesn't. And then the last challenge I have listed here is about robust buyer claims. It's really important. Um, actually, if you just go back uh, to the previous slide. Yeah, perfect. Um, it's really important to have clear and consistent market guidance about the claims that can be made um, about projects, about credits, and ideally about how those fit into a company's broader sort of nature positive journey. Um, and so I think this is something where we really need to um, act faster than we did in the carbon space, where the carbon market was operating for decades before we came to a net zero concept. Um, I think we have an opportunity here to, to unpack nature positive as a sort of claim um, and, and help uh, guide buyers to, to make appropriate claims when they purchase these credits. And then on the opportunity side, um, we have advancing science and technology, which will hopefully bring down the cost of monitoring, reporting, and verifying these outcomes um, while maintaining the rigor and credibility in that quantification. So I do think we're you know, starting at a much more advanced state. Um, the next one here is about there being more flexibility than in the voluntary carbon market. Um, I think this is largely due to the fact that um, these credits are not meant to be used as offsets, so we can be a bit more flexible on things like additionality and the metrics required. And then the last last one, which is really important, I know I mentioned it earlier, but learning from the voluntary carbon market. Um, we can start at a much more advanced stage 
we can have market infrastructure that we didn't have at the start of the voluntary carbon market, like you know, advanced registry systems or uh, buyer guidance, um, these types of things. So I think we are at a major advantage there. Uh, we just have to make sure we're taking advantage of it um, and kind of picking up where voluntary markets have, have gotten us to so far. So the next slide, and I just have one more slide after this, um, but this just gives you an idea of who's been involved in the development process. So these organizations that you see here um, have been involved uh, working very closely with Vera over the last couple of years to collaborate bring in uh, experts from different areas um, to help us actually co-create um, and, and iterate on, on the framework and its requirements. And then all of this work has been supported by the Nature Framework Advisory Group, which is a group of another 25 organizations and individuals um, with different expertise to help us really build a, a scientifically um, a sound methodology. And then last but not least is just a timeline of, of where we're headed with the developments of the nature framework. Um, so uh, just on the next slide here, um, <clears throat> we launched the first draft of the nature framework uh, just about a week and a half ago on September 18th for public consultation. That will run for 60 days. So through the middle of November, we would love to have any of your input um, on that framework uh, draft. You can uh, see that on our websites and there's a Google form that you would fill out with your feedback. So it should be fairly easy for you to do so. Um, at the same time, we're launching a pilot process. So we have 18 projects that were selected from 179 applications to pilot the nature framework. So that'll be taking place over the next several months, also contributing to the iteration of the framework. And then we'll likely have a, another consultation on the second sort of draft of the nature framework in early 2024. And the ultimate goal is to release the first version for use of the nature framework in around the middle of next year. So uh, like I said, please do uh, provide your comments if, if you're interested. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback and ensure that the framework is, is workable on the ground and has that right level of rigor. So with that, yes, I'll pass it back uh, to Stephanie um, and thank you again for the opportunity to share this information. Thanks a lot, Sinclair. That was really interesting. Um, I, I got a few questions about what you last mentioned, like the implementation schedule. Do you have any information about where these pilots will be implemented so that we can check out uh, if there are some in, in South America or in the Caribbean? Yes, so we will be publishing probably a, a map that shows all the different pilot project locations. Um, mm -hmm. So that will be probably coming soon. I can confirm that we do have projects in uh, Central and South America. We've tried to have geographic representation from across the world. Um, it was hard to narrow it down, but I think we landed in a good place. I know we at least have, um, I think, one in Panama. Um, and uh, perhaps one in Colombia. There, there's 18 mm -hmm. of them. So we'll, we'll definitely be sharing more about their location. Great. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, uh, here's one, there's two from Natalia Arango, who's from, from, from the Acción, the, the, um, the trust from the environmental fund from Colombia. And the first one is, um, aware of the fact that these are not meant to be offset tools, are there any interactions with the habitat bank approach or logic? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think there's a lot that can be learned from habitat banking um, and different countries have different approaches to it, but um, there's, there's certainly similarities in some of the approaches, but these credits are still not meant to be used in a sort of a compensatory way. Um, okay. Of course, that's hard with biodiversity because biodiversity is local. Um, it's not like carbon in the atmosphere that is, you know, global. Um, and so while we're not trying to say that you should use these credits to, um, you know, in a particular context, you do need to be aware of the fact that biodiversity is specific to a certain area and it's kind of tied to that land or, or seascape. Um, so there, there are different approaches, but I think a lot of the theory behind it and the methodological approach can be quite similar when you're quantifying the, the outcomes of any sort of um, effort to restore or, or protect a habitat. Okay, great. And that's the second one is recognizing the challenges of the carbon market today. Do you have an assessment of the size and projections of the nature credits market? 
Yeah, it's another good question. And and I know McKinsey has done several kind of assessments or different projections of how this could play out. And I think they have pretty reasonable projections to think that it could be as big as the voluntary carbon market is right now in only a few years from now. Um, I think it really depends on the demand side. It depends on to what extent companies start to understand their impacts and dependencies and then understand the use case um, and the reason for investing in these biodiversity projects. If we can help them do that, then I think we do have the possibility of getting this market to even beyond uh, the scale of the voluntary carbon market at this moment. Yeah, because I understand that, I mean, it's the first time that the, the I, 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 I learned uh, about these credits, about how they work, but I understand that this is a mechanism to basically uh, channel funds to uh, protecting biodiversity so this is like this is um uh all on a voluntary basis so this would be like companies wanting to invest into um taking care of biodiversity so this will all be voluntary that's yeah. right uh that's right but it, it does impact the company themselves right so just to give an example if you are a uh, a company that has coffee stores worldwide um, and mm -hmm. therefore you rely on coffee plantations to actually be mm -hmm. able to serve coffee to your to your customers um, and those coffee plantations uh, depend on pollinators you may want to be investing ensuring that the areas around the places where you source your coffee beans are actually providing habitat for the pollinators that are key to the production of coffee. And of course, there's many other ecosystem services that those coffee plantations rely on. So uh, okay. that's the type of thinking that I think we'll start mm -hmm. to see companies have when they really start to understand. I mean, I think they understand what nature is, right? But I don't know how much they understand exactly what they rely on in their supply chain to you know, get to their service, whatever it is that they're providing at the end of the day. Yeah. It's like a way to to uh, to put a price to these positive external effects that you usually uh, talk about in economics, and that's like a way to to yeah to measure that. So that's very interesting. I just had one more question from your presentation because you you, you talked about that this was a very fractured market. So there is no one way uh, to approach um, the way how you measure biodiversity. But you talked about a quality hectare. Is there like one, is this a unit that other standards are using or are there like different kinds to like starting points? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I don't think any of the other main standards are using the exact term of quality hectare, but the mm -hmm. concept of it being sort of like a 1% um, uplift in biodiversity in a hectare um, is pretty common across most of those methodologies. So, and I would say that the biggest ones out there are coming from Plan Vivo or Terrasos, which is a Colombian based methodology. Um, and I think all, all of those are, are really thinking about that sort of percent uplift in a, in a hectare over a particular time. Um, so that part is fairly common, um, but there's mm -hmm. just kind of some minor differences in, in how it's quantified. But actually, that's very similar to the the baseline that you have, for example, for our red project. So, yeah. I, and you know, all the conversation that that's been around uh, the real additionality and problems and, and measuring the baseline. So, are there any? Uh, so, what what are you what are you doing so that you don't have the same problem in these biodiversity cr credits that act that you have right now for the the red plus projects. Yeah, no, exactly. So this is an area where we can and absolutely should learn from the voluntary carbon market. And, and that's what Vera has been doing over actually multiple years now. We've been working on the next evolution of our red methodologies, which is, is due to come out later this year um, in the con consolidated red methodology. And in that methodology, we're taking a jurisdictional approach to baseline mm -hmm. setting. So instead of um, having projects set their baselines and running the risk of having, you know, in a, in a particular jurisdiction, all of those project baselines add up to more carbon than even exists in, in that jurisdiction, because that's just what happens if you have different, you know, calculations occurring. Um, so instead of doing that, what we're doing is having jurisdictional baselines set. So looking across a jurisdiction 
And we, with third parties, are, are getting the data to actually establish those baselines and then allocating them to projects based on risk across the jurisdiction. Because even if a, a jurisdiction as a whole has a particular, you know, declining trend in carbon or biodiversity, there could be areas within that jurisdiction that have a much higher or lower um, rate of loss. And so we want to account for that so that there aren't projects that are sort of being punished or or maybe even overly rewarded. So being able to allocate the baseline based on risk across the jurisdiction, and then you essentially assign those to projects. So that should bring actually much lo lower burden to projects and, uh, and a lot more um, the math will add up um, and, and bring more integrity to, to the system. Now that we actually have the ability to get this data through remote sensing and these types of tools that we just didn't have back um, when we first developed those methodologies. And so we're trying to take that same approach on an eco-regional basis for biodiversity, um, where you, you have eco-regional baselines and allocate them across that eco-region, or yeah, the baseline across the eco-region based on known risks or pressures to biodiversity. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. Um, it will take a bit more time to actually develop it, but ideally um, we'll be able to do that in the next year or so and make it a lot easier for projects to, to figure out what their baseline is. But, but that, that means also that governments should play a very important role uh, in this new um, biodiversity credit ecosystem. Yes, of yeah, course. So I we mean, need I governments for... to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for any of these mechanisms to be successful, the the more participation, the better. Um, so mm -hmm. whether that's by governments, you know, unlocking regulation to make sure that you know projects are eligible, or giving them clear guidance on you know what do projects need to consider in that jurisdiction if they want to participate in these voluntary programs, um, and also any data that the government may have that could mm -hmm. be useful and and figuring out what those baselines should be. I mean, here in Peru, uh, the government is working on this jurisdictional baseline for red projects. Do you know of any other government worldwide that is like uh, working on on creating this biodiversity baseline, or is yeah. there, or is, is this too? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I know I, there are definitely governments, um, some countries that are, are very focused on this. So, of course, Australia is is doing a lot of work in the biodiversity space. Um, the UK and French governments are leading kind of a bit more of a global um, effort to to help understand what biodiversity credits could mean. Um, but I don't know that they're necessarily setting baselines for their countries. Um, there's, I think, a couple others, um, but it's, I think, a little bit early. I think it's, some of the, what we're doing on the carbon side can also be used for biodiversity, where, for example, forest cover is a good measure of biodiversity. But of course, you can have a forest that's fully intact, but have a lot of poaching going on. And so you wouldn't be out, your forest mm -hmm. cover doesn't really tell you about biodiversity impacts related to poaching. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's gonna be a several different data layers that would probably have to go into this. Um, and I think governments are starting to kind of turn their attention to the biodiversity part, but they're even further behind uh, probably on that than, than carbon. Okay. Um, great. It's a very, very interesting topic. We have, I, I would like to uh, read two more questions from the audience. And um, one is uh, uh, Jerry Bro asks, in our area of Cusi Conservancy in southern Peru, protection measures are being provided for wildlife and ecosystems that are being impacted. impacted. Our project consists in implementing pilot seaweed farms to increase more carbon absorbed through seaweed. How can your efforts help Kusi Conservancy accomplish and maintain our work in this aspect? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is probably a question that anybody that ha is involved in a project um, can and should be asking is, you know, to what what amount of nature credits or carbon credits could they be generating? And unfortunately, I can't answer that question without knowing a lot of more information about the project, but I would encourage you to look at the nature framework in its current draft version and run a couple test calculations um, just to try to get an idea of what is the you know volume of credits and therefore finance you'd be able to receive um, to continue the operations of these projects. Um, I mean, of course, just based on this description, it sounds like you absolutely would have potentially both carbon and biodiversity benefits generated from this type of project. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the first step would just be trying to understand how much is actually generated 
to know whether or not it's worthwhile to pursue this financial mechanism. Because it does take a lot of work to actually develop the documentation and have that third party audit. Um, which we try to bring those costs down as much as possible, but it does take a, a good amount of money to, to be a project. And, and, and what about, about the pricing here? So, I mean, nowadays you, you have like, like uh, some idea about the cost or the price that you can send, uh, uh, you can sell a red a red um, credit or, or blue carbon credit, but but biodiversity, I mean, what, what's like the range? Do you have any, I, I mean, you haven't even implemented a, a, a pilot, so I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. And, and honestly, Vera does not get involved in, in pricing because we're not involved yeah. in the transaction of units as our role as a standard body is to, to be independent. Um, but I would say just based on what I know it takes to operate a project like this, where mm -hmm. um, it could be very similar to the cost of carbon, but it could actually be a lot more. Um, and the value of the biodiversity could be a lot more depending on you know what exactly it is, what the loss rate is and what the investor is, is interested in, in supporting. So mm -hmm. my best guess is that it's gonna be at least the price of a red credit, um, but, uh, if you were to ask me just in my personal um, perspective as an environmentalist, um, I think the, the price on biodiversity should be much higher. Um, we have mm -hmm. a lot to lose if we don't protect it. Yeah, great. And then the, uh, we have a last question for, from uh, Stefan Nies. He's, he says, could you describe what an ideal pilot project would look like in the Peruvian Amazon uh, about size, actors involved, for example, public-private community partnership? Yeah, um, it's a good question on size. That's actually something we're trying to sort out is how small can a project be for it to be cost-effective? So hopefully mm -hmm. we'll learn about that in the pilot process and, and we'd like to be able to share that so that people with really small projects understand, you know, this might not be the mechanism for you or you need to partner with some other smaller areas to try to have a, a grouped project as we call it. Um, so stay tuned on that because that's something that will be really important for us to communicate um, based on our learnings. But otherwise I would say the most important thing to be a, su a successful pilot or, or full project um, when the framework is released is um, getting that baseline data. Um, so I would say if you haven't measured uh, your you know ecosystem condition indicators now to start doing that so that you can really understand what is your starting point, what is that initial um, condition level at your project site, and then the other piece that you can't really go back and do in time is that free prior informed consent um, of the indigenous peoples, local communities, and other stakeholders in that area. Ideally, they'd be participating in the project, maybe even the project proponent themselves. Um, but making sure that you're actually working with them to establish the project plan, um, the stakeholder engagement plan, uh, having a grievance redress mechanism in place, um, kind of all of the community engagement that is required to have a, any any activity, whether it's a project under our program or not, be successful. Um, so I think those are all the things that need to be done up front on, on any project. Um, and I encourage you to, to get that started um, as soon as possible. Well, really interesting. I would love to to keep on going and asking you more questions. There are lots lots of questions from the audience, but I think we we we've got to leave it there. And um, this uh, this session is being recorded. It will be uploaded on the on the web page of Red Lab. I don't have it right now. Maybe we can share that afterwards. It's it's where we've been uploading the the previous sessions and also Sinclair's presentation. So Sinclair, it was really a pleasure to, to have you here today. It was very interesting and we will be following all the, the how this um, market develops. It's really great. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the discussion. Then to the audience, see you next week. And thanks. Have a great day. Bye.